Welcome to the Great Detectives of Old Time Radio. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham. If you have a comment, email it to me, box13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives and check us out on Instagram, instagram.com slash greatdetectives. If you want to be sure to never miss an episode of the podcast, I want to encourage you to follow us using your favorite podcast software. Our listener support campaign concludes today and you can become one of our Patreon supporters over at patreon.greatdetectives.net. And I want to go ahead and thank Yigal for supporting us at the Shamus level of $4 or more per month. Thank you so much for your support, Yigal. And now it is time for this week's episode of Tales of the Texas Rangers. The original air date, May 18th, 1952, and the title is Smart Kill. Tales of the Texas Rangers, starring Joel McRae as Ranger Jace Pearson. Another authentic reenactment of a case transcribed from the files of the Texas Rangers. Dates and places in the following story are fictitious for obvious reasons. The events themselves are a matter of record. Every day, Monday through Friday, there's top entertainment all day long when you set your radio dial to NBC. Listen for Double or Nothing, and you'll hear one of radio's funniest quiz shows. Yes, Walter O'Keefe consistently comes up with great comedy entertainment Monday through Friday on Double or Nothing. Listen, and you'll agree. And then there's the program with a heart, Strike It Rich. The grand entertainment that Warren Hull brings you every day on Strike It Rich is just what the doctor ordered if you suffer from the housework blues. From Chicago, Tommy Bartlett brings you Welcome Travelers and interviews with the many interesting guests who each day pass through the Windy City. And for more fun, listen for Bob and Ray, those two zany comics. Then there's music and charm with Dave Garraway. So remember, every day, Monday through Friday, chase your blues away with the wonderful daytime programs on this station of the NBC Radio Network. And now, here's today's Tales of the Texas Rangers. And now, from the files of the Texas Rangers, the case called Smart Kill. It is approximately 11 o'clock on the evening of May 14th, 1939. In the small South Texas town of Carville, Mr. and Mrs. Edward Woodley have been spending the evening at the home of friends. Called to the telephone, but a moment ago, Ed Woodley, his face flushed with excitement, now hurries across the room to his wife's side. Martha! Yes, dear. Martha, come on. We gotta get out of here. Ed Woodley, have you taken leave of your senses? Here, I picked up your coat and purse. Quick now. For sam's sake, Ed. Amy, I'll I'll call you. Good night, Tom. Call you tomorrow, John. The world is this all about. Never mind, I'll explain in a minute. In this side, Martha. Push over, I'll drive. Well, I never... Ed Woodley, what's the big idea of running out on Amy's party that way? Heavens, what will everyone think? I think I did right in not busting up the party. Well, you certainly didn't help it any. Now, would you mind telling me why you made such a spectacle of yourself and why you're driving this car like a maniac? Martha, that phone call was from Sheriff Fuller. He said our feed and grain company's on fire and burning like fury. Oh, no, Ed. That's what he said. Look off there. You can see the flames in the sky now. Oh, Oh, Ed, why didn't you tell me before? Well, I couldn't see any point in telling about it at the party. Would have busted it up for sure. I'm sorry I spoke like I did. Well, don't blame him. Oh, I sure hope the fire department's there. We'll know as soon as we get around this bend. Oh, Ed! Yes, yeah, Sheriff was right. She sure got a good start. The fireman can hardly get near it. Really burning, Martha. Sheriff Fuller. Got his hands full, keeping folks back. Now, 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 that's fair enough, 
Step back. Please, keep back. Oh, I'm glad you got here, Ed. I'm afraid she's pretty much on the way. She's bound to go up like tinder sheriff. She's piled high with feed, grain, and cotton. Yeah. Oh, I sure wish I could get in there for just about two minutes, so. Don't you dare try to get near there. I said I wish, Martha. All my ledgers in there. Don't know how I'll ever get straight on paperwork. Firemen are having a terrible time getting close. You can feel that heat all the way over here. Thank the Lord it didn't happen when someone was in there. That's your office right where that window is, isn't it, Ed? Yes, but it might just... Well, Martha, no, what is it? The window. I saw a face, a man's face. Now, calm down, Martha. The way the flames jump around, you just imagined it. Yeah, there's nothing there now, Miss Woodley. I tell you, I saw a face at that window. Then it, it seemed to fall back inside. Martha, please. Could anyone have gotten in there tonight, Ed? Of course not. There is no... Look! Look, now! What? Sheriff, she's right. Yeah. There is someone in there. I, I know. I, I saw him just oh. before he fell back in here. We've got to try to get him, Sheriff. How, Ed? You're oh. gross before you got anywhere near. Oh. We can't just stand oh, here. There must be something we can do. Just one thing, ma'am. Oh. Pray for him. It's too late oh. for anything else. Roaring fire raged far into the night, completely destroying the feed and grain building. Sheriff Fuller, suspecting criminal intent, asked for the help of the Texas Rangers. Ranger Jace Pearson was assigned, arriving at Carville the following morning. He and Sheriff Fuller went immediately to the scene of the fire, only to find a good many curious townsfolk already there. It's a good thing my deputies were out here all night, Jace. Folks just wouldn't stay away. Morbid curiosity, Sheriff. According to what you told me, the body should be right around here someplace. Yeah, just about. Well, let's just... Over there, Sheriff. What is it, Jason? What we're looking for? Or what's left of them? Good Lord. That's awful. Fire's a pretty awful thing. Hey, watch where you kneel, Jason. Hard to tell what's burned through and what's still solid. Yeah, I know. The fire did a real thorough job. It's not going to be easy getting an identification on it. He's too far gone. Mm -hmm. I was afraid of that. A fire like this didn't just roar up in a minute, Sheriff. It took time. This fellow, whoever he is, wasn't drunk or hurt. Why didn't he get out? Mm, I never thought of that. I want to see the front and back doors, Sheriff. Sure thing. This way, Chief. Here's the back door right here. Sure not much left of it. Well, this helps. Padlock, huh? Yeah, a big one. Uh, locks from the outside. Still locked. Let's get to that front door. Over this way. Be careful, Sheriff. A lot of these spots still hold their heat. Yeah, I know it. The front door should be about here someplace. This is it. Look at it, Sheriff. Another padlock. This one locks from the outside, too. I guess that answers your question of why he didn't get out. It sure does. It couldn't have been an accident. He was put in here. That makes it murder with malice, Sheriff. That figures. Well, what's the next move? Right now, there's only one important thing. Identification of the body. As soon as the J.P.'s through with him, we'll have an autopsy performed. Sure not much left of him to work with. I know. Maybe his teeth will tell us something. Yeah, but that'll take some time, Jace. We won't be just standing idle in the meantime, Sheriff. There's a lot of work to be done. A lot of work. Later, the sheriff and I were at the home of Ed Woodley, the man who owned the burned-out building. Both Woodley and his wife looked haggard and weary-eyed over their coffee cups. It was easy to believe they'd been at the fire all night. Once the sheriff had introduced us, Woodley lost no time getting to the point. Well, what'd you find out, Ranger? Do you know who that man is yet? No, Mr. Woodley, we don't. Well, I'll be in the kitchen if anybody wants anything. The body was pretty well burned, Mr. Woodley. Going to be hard to identify. We can use your help. Have you got any idea who he could be or how he got in there? No, not the least idea in the world. Was well, the building always kept locked at night? Always, Ranger. From what I could see, there are just two doors. Uh, how many windows? Two. Well, they looked burglar-proof to me. They were, but not fireproof. You own the feed and grain business by yourself, Mr. Woodley? No, Sam Taylor's my partner in the business. He's got that form of the joint's mine. I see. Mr. Woodley, who else besides yourself has a key to the building? Why, uh, there's only two keys, Ranger. Sam's got one and I got the other. Yeah, this is mine right here. Where can I find your partner? I'm afraid you'll have to wait on that, Ranger. Sam's been on the road for more than a week. He does the traveling for us. 
I think he's in Dallas now, but he should be home in a day or so. You think, Mr. Woodley? Don't you know? Well, Sam's not much of a hand for phoning me, Ranger. And what do you mean? He, he and his wife, they've only been married about a year. <laughs> I guess you'd call him a kind of lovesick fella. When he's on the road, he does all his phoning to his wife. We'll look her up. I don't suppose I've been much help to you, Ranger. Just can't figure how a thing like this could happen. Be a lot easier to figure later on, Mr. Woodley. After we find out who the man was in the fire. The sheriff and I got in the car and drove to the farm of Sam Taylor, Ed Woodley's partner. Though the two partners' farms adjoined each other, they were both big spreads, and the drive took a good 15 minutes. Main house is just a little farther down the road, Jace. Mm. Good-looking farm, Sheriff. Yeah. You don't have to worry none about Sam Taylor or Ed Woodley. Everybody in town knows they got no use for each other, but business-wise, they do right well for themselves. You get the feeling Woodley's got no use for his partner's wife, Sheriff? Yeah, well, she is kind of uppity. Keeps to herself, mostly. That's one of the reasons Sam Taylor isn't as popular as he might be. Uh, this is it, Jace. Turn in here. Uh-huh. Jace, tell me something. Are you figuring Woodley burned down his own building for some reason? Say, like insurance? It doesn't figure. If he wanted to do that, he sure wouldn't put a body in there. Mm, you're right. That don't make sense. Who runs this place for him? I've got a Mexican who handles most of it. Yes. Oh, Sheriff Fuller. Good uh, morning, Miss Taylor. Uh, this is Ranger Pearson. Ranger? Howdy, ma'am. Is there something I can do for you? We'd like to talk to you, if we may. Of course. Won't you come in? I hope we're not interrupting anything. Of course not. What gave you that idea? I thought I heard you talking to someone. Oh, that must have been the radio. You'll have to forgive the house being so untidy. I haven't been able to get at my housework, what with people phoning to tell me about the fire. Excuse me, I'll just turn that radio off. Won't you sit down? Thank you, ma'am. Now, uh, what can I do for you? It's about your husband, Mrs. Taylor. Mr. Woodley says he's out of town. That's right. He's out of town working while Mr. Woodley stays at home. Can't even prevent the business from burning down. You know that there was a body found in the fire, Mrs. Taylor? Well, so I hear. We'd like to talk to your husband. Exactly where is he now? Why, well, how could he possibly have anything to do with this? He's in Dallas. Where's he staying? At the Barclay Hotel. Have you heard from him since he's been away? Yes, he called me from there night before last. And you haven't heard from him since? No. That's what we wanted to know. Thanks for your help, Mrs. Taylor. You're quite welcome. Ranger, have you any idea yet who could have started this fire? We're more interested in the man who died in it. Of course. Goodbye, ma'am. Goodbye, Ranger. Hey, Jason. Uh, wait till we get in the car. What were you going to say, Sheriff? When she first opened the front door, did you hear a door in the back slam? I did better than that. From where I was, through the window, I could see a man hightailing it away from the house. Looked like a Mexican. Tall, good-looking fellow? Yeah. Arturo Ramirez. He's the foreman I was telling you about. Oh. I wonder what he was doing in the house this time of day. That's what I was thinking. Well, what do we do now, Jace? Run up to Dallas and hear what Sam Taylor has to say. <laughs> We made good time on the road, and at 5 o'clock that afternoon, walked into the lobby of the Barclay Hotel in Dallas. As we approached the desk, the room clerk, a fussy little man, about 50, looked up at us over his bifocals. <clears throat> yes, sir? Can I help you? Uh, what room is Sam Taylor in, please? Oh, he's in room uh, 401. Or was that 403? Uh, just let me check on that, will you, please? You know, Jace... If Sam Taylor had anything to do with that fire, being registered here would give him a pretty strong alibi. Yeah, no, I'm... Well, I'm terribly sorry, sir. I was mistaken. That's all right. What room is he in? Well, that's just it, sir. He isn't in any room. Mr. Taylor checked out three days ago. In just a moment, we will continue with Tales of the Texas Rangers, starring Joel McRae as Ranger Jace Pearson. You've seen it happen time and time again. Children playing. A ball rolls into the street. A child rushes after it, full in the path of a speeding automobile. 
Perhaps the driver stops in time. The chances are he can't. And another tragedy, another accident due to carelessness is chalked up to become a figure on next year's statistical chart of traffic accidents. Let's all keep this year's traffic accident rate as low as possible. Stay within the speed limit. Don't endanger your life by trying to get somewhere too quickly. Better late than never may be a tired old saying, but it's also good common sense. Be alert and careful every moment you're behind the wheel. Never drive after drinking. Stick to your side of the road and watch for warnings at grade crossings. Remember, it's your life that's at stake. You can't afford to be careless. The life you save may be your own. And now we return you to Tales of the Texas Rangers. We continue now with Tales of the Texas Rangers and our authentic story, Smart Kill. We were fairly sure that Mrs. Taylor had lied about receiving her husband's call from the Dallas Hotel since the record showed he had left there three days before. As we approached Carville the following morning, we were radioed that the autopsy report was waiting for us at the sheriff's office. We decided to look at it first before our talk with Mrs. Taylor. Anything interesting in it, Jace? Plenty, Sheriff. There was a removable bridge in the victim's mouth. Doc turned it over to the lab crew. Boy, that could sure help. Yeah. Now listen to this. A broken knife blade, approximately three inches in length, found lodged in the third rib just below the heart. Stabbed? Uh-huh. From condition of the rib, knife was apparently driven in with great force. The rib bone itself deflecting the blow away from the heart. But I saw him at the window trying to get out of that burning building. Sounds like something the killer didn't figure on. What do you mean? I got a hunch the victim wasn't supposed to be alive when he was put in there. Oh, excuse me. Sheriff Fuller. Oh, yeah, Johnny, we just got in. Yeah, we just been looking over the autopsy report. Well, good. We figured you would. Let us know if you hear anything, huh? Fine. That was your lab man, Jace. He just wants you to know he sent out pictures of the victim's bridge work to all the dentists in the county. Let's hope we get a quick identification on those teeth, and we won't be working only on theories. Jace, you're thinking that body could be Sam Taylor, aren't you? What else can I think, Sheriff? He left Dallas more than three days ago. Mrs. Taylor lied to us about that phone call. I think that body in the fire stands a pretty good chance of being Taylor. Come on. Let's get out to Mrs. Taylor's and see what she's got to say. Oh, but good morning, Ranger. Sheriff Fuller. Morning, Miss Taylor. We'd like to have another talk with you, if you don't mind. Well, I, uh... Would it be all right if I dropped around to your office later in the day instead, Sheriff? I think it's important enough that we talk now, Mrs. Taylor. Uh, very well. Come in. Hey, Peggy, where you keep the cayenne pe- oh. oh, I'm sorry. I, I didn't know that you had visitors. Well, that's all right, Arturo. This is Ranger Pearson and Sheriff Fuller. Arturo Ramirez, our foreman. Ramirez? Uh, Senores, glad to know you. <laughs> Arturo's not only our foreman, he also cooks the best Mexican food in the state. He's making enchiladas for lunch. Now, if you gentlemen would care to stay... Uh, thanks just the same, Mrs. Taylor. It's a little early for lunch. <laughs> well, of course, you won't be ready for a while yet. Uh, si, si, senores. Uh, good Mexican cooking takes a lot of time, you know. It m- must be started early in the day. Uh, well, if you have no further need of me... Uh, I return to the kitchen. When I start it, senores. Mrs. Taylor, why did you tell us your husband called from Dallas two days ago? Because he did. Why? We went to Dallas after we left here yesterday. Your husband checked out of the Barclay Hotel three days ago. Oh, but that's impossible. I tell... Excuse me a minute. Hello? Yes, he's here. Just a minute. It's for you, Ranger. Thanks. Hello, Pearson. They did? Good. Who? That definite? I see. Thanks a lot. That was the lab man, Sheriff. Your deputy told him we'd be here. Dentist about 15 miles from here identified that bridge work. Who was the dead man, Jace? Who we thought it was? 
Yeah. It's not easy to say this, Mrs. Taylor. What is it? They've identified the man in the fire. It was your husband. Oh, no. Oh, no. I'm afraid so, ma'am. Would you rather we came back at another time, Mrs. Taylor? No, I... I'll be all right with the baby. I hate to ask questions at a time like this, but there are some things we have to know. But what is it you want? Who's your husband's beneficiary, Mrs. Taylor? Well, I am, of course. Who else would be? I know what you're thinking, that I had something to do with his death. Well, you're crazy, do you hear me? This is our job, Mrs. Taylor. I'll give you something to think about. I'll show you. You you want a suspect, do you? You just wait till I show you this insurance policy. There. Read it. For God, read it. Read it. There's a policy on my husband's life of $50,000. And who's the beneficiary on that one? Who is it, Jason? Edward Woodley. The sheriff and I left Mrs. Taylor, got in the car, and drove to the adjoining farm of Ed Woodley. I wanted to know about that policy I'd just been shown. Why, sure, Ranger. That policy's been in effect for about three years. One of those personal policies. Why was it taken out? Well, it's pretty common practice when two partners are important to a business. Ask any insurance man. If Sam dies, I collect. If I die, he collects. Why didn't you mention it when we were here before? Didn't seem a reason to. I still don't. Why are you so interested in that policy anyway? Because you're about to collect on it. The dead man in the fire was your partner. Sam? Well, but how did he... Are you sure, Ranger? We're sure. I think you better come down with us to the sheriff's office, Mr. Woodley. What for? Why? Because you profit by your partner's death. That could be a pretty good motive for murder. For a minute, I thought Woodley was going to give us trouble. Then, without a word, he got his hat and came along with us. When we got to the sheriff's office, we left Woodley with a deputy and went into the inner office to see Johnny Blanche, our lab man. He was packing the dead man's effects in a cardboard box as we entered. About finished up, Johnny? Yeah, there's nothing much more I can do until I get this stuff to the lab. Hope we didn't keep you waiting too long. Oh, no. I've been making out a receipt for you, Sheriff. I'll just sign it and get along. I see that receipt, Johnny? Sure thing. Yeah. Thanks. Wallet, pen, coins... Anything wrong, Jase? I'm sure I listed everything. Johnny, would you mind if I take a look at that box? Oh, not at all. Everything there? Yeah. Everything you got on your list, but... I don't know. Something's... Wait a minute. The key. Where is his key? What key? The one Taylor used to get in the building. Well, there wasn't any key found on Taylor's body. Well, if there wasn't, we got the wrong man sitting in the outer office. How do you mean, Jase? Don't you see, Sheriff, there were only two keys to the building, one for each partner. Taylor's is missing. Now, if Woodley were the killer, he wouldn't have to steal Taylor's key. You mean someone used Taylor's key to get him into the building? It sure looks like it. Yeah, but, Jase, Mrs. Taylor'd be the only other one who could profit by her husband's death. And she wouldn't have the strength to get him in there. Now, unless she had some help. Yeah, but who? That Mexican foreman of hers. He seemed obliging in a lot of ways. Maybe the motive wasn't money after all. Yeah, they were pretty friendly. Sheriff, let's you and I pay another visit to the lady who was so broken up by her husband's death. After we got a search warrant, we took Mr. Woodley to his house. Ten minutes later, the sheriff and I were knocking at Mrs. Taylor's front door. There was no one home. We decided to wait till she showed up. Thirty yards from the house was Ramirez's shack. The door was unlocked, so we went in and looked. Jace, this drawer here is just crammed full of expensive shirts. Ah, something interesting here, too. What do you got? Expensive piece of luggage. And look at those initials. S.T. Sam Taylor. It sure doesn't stand for Arturo Ramirez. More shirts. Uh, guess he didn't have enough room for them in the drawer. Yeah. Well, this sure proves Taylor came back home. Yeah. Probably found Ramirez in the house. That's what started it all. Hey, wait a minute, Jace. There's a car coming. Could be them. Uh, leave the bag here. Let's get outside. Yeah, we can just about meet him at the house, Sheriff. 
I want to hear them explain what we found in that shack. They'll try. You seem to like it here, Ranger. You visit so often. This will be the last time, Mrs. Taylor. Uh, I'll put the car away, Senor. You leave the car right where it is, Ramirez. Get out of it and come over here. See, 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 I come. Mrs. Taylor, I got a search warrant here. I'll start with your handbag. Well, You've no right to do this. Here's the key, Sheriff. What? Same kind Woodley has. That's my husband's keys. That's the first time you've told the truth, Mrs. Taylor. What about you, Ramirez? Me, senor? Yes, you. You got an idea where we can find half a knife? N- knife? What knife? The one Mr. Taylor was stabbed with. You're crazy. Here, here's my knife. Yeah, shiny and new. But how are you going to explain Taylor's shirts and luggage in your shack, Ramirez? I want to hear that. Ramirez, you fool. A $40 bag and a couple of dozen shirts you just couldn't resist. I, I, I didn't mean to do it, Keep Ramirez. your mouth shut, Ramirez. He started to fight with me. It was her idea to make the fire so it would look like an accident. Ramirez! Uh, I won't die for you. I won't. You. Hold it, Ramirez. No, no, you let me go. I said hold it. You stupid fool. I can't stand the sight of you. I wish I'd never seen you. You won't have to worry about that anymore, Mrs. Taylor. I don't think you're going to see each other for a long, long time. In just a moment, we will tell you the results of the case you have just heard. Throughout the remainder of the day, you'll find more great entertainment awaiting you on this NBC station. Be sure to hear The First Nighter, starring Barbara Luddy and Olin Soleil in a drama entitled Found One Mother. Then it stars in Khaki and Blue, featuring talented members of the armed forces, with Meredith Wilson as guest master of ceremonies. And be sure to hear the hilarious Phil Harris Alice Faye show, featuring the comedy antics of Frankie Remley, Julius Abruzio, and Brother William. Remember, too, that Theater Guild on the Air brings you Over 21, the hilarious comedy of Army Life by an Army wife, Ruth Gordon, who will star in the air play along with Van Heflin. Later tonight, Jack Parr will be around to ask the $64 question. Sunday is fun day on NBC because of the many fine shows sent your way to add to your listening pleasure. So remember, for fine entertainment all the rest of the day, keep tuned to this station of the NBC Radio Network. At home or away, at work or at play, wherever you go, there's radio. And now back to the conclusion of today's Tales of the Texas Rangers. And now, here are the results of the case you have just heard. On July 11th, 1939, Peggy Taylor and Arturo Ramirez were tried for the murder of Samuel Taylor. They were found guilty. Peggy Taylor was sentenced to the women's prison at Gorey for 40 years. And Arturo Ramirez was sent to Huntsville Penitentiary for the rest of his life. And here again is the star of our show, Joel McRae. Folks, I want to take this opportunity to thank you again for the many wonderful letters that we've received from you listeners. Hearing from you brings us just a little closer to our family of friends who listen to Tales of the Texas Rangers each week. I want to tell you a little story about our good friend and technical advisor, Captain M.T. Lone Wolf Gonzalez. Several years ago, Kilgore, Texas, found an oil field at his front door. In eight weeks, the dusty, sleepy little village of 900 population became a sprawling, brawling city of 25,000. Strangers streamed in by the thousands, and with the good people came the motley horde of confidence men, gamblers, and professional thugs. Soon, the honest, hard-working people of the community found themselves at the mercy of these racketeers. Gonzalez was ordered to go in and clean up the community. In his first offensive, he rounded up 500 persons whom he considered undesirable and clapped them in jail. When I asked him how he could tell the good people from the bad, he said, Well, in those days, it wasn't hard at all. I just looked at their hands. If they had working man's hands with calluses on them, I figured they were trying to make an honest dollar. But if their hands were smooth and lily-white... I reckon they weren't up to too much good, and into the who's gal they'd go. Wasn't wrong very often either. So long, folks. See you next week. Next week, Joel McRae in another authentic reenactment of a case from the files of the Texas Rangers. Go 
Joel McRae will soon be seen in San Francisco Story, a Warner Brothers release. The cast included Tony Barrett, Parley Bear, Virginia Gregg, Barney Phillips, Betty Lou Gerson, and Howard McNair. Technical advisor was Captain M.T. Lone Wolf Gonzalez of the Texas Rangers. This story was transcribed and adapted by Anthony Barrett, and the program was produced and directed by Stacy Keach. Hal Gibney speaking. Next, it's The Chase on NBC. Welcome back. Well, a really engaging murder mystery. I kept going back and forth as to who did it. So it was a good story to adapt, and I thought they handled it really well. I was just kept guessing throughout. Because it's a case where you had two equal motives, and of course there was even a period for suspecting the victim. Now we turn to listener comments and feedback, and we go over to YouTube, and... And a listener, Duck Duck, comments, Goodness, no wonder she never let him, a.k.a. the murderer, into her room. Of course, in the time, particularly being a school teacher, that was not something that many women would have done, particularly teachers who had to be seen as role models and avoid scandal or even the hint of it. And then we have Saysoft, who writes in, you know, even if the murderer's plan to prevent the police from finding the victim's body would have succeeded, things still might not have worked out well for the murderer. I say that because the case is very similar to the real case of Hans Reiser back in 2006. Reiser, a software engineer who invented the Riser FS file system for Linux, was married to a Russian girl and was living with her and their kids in California. At some point after they separated, the wife disappeared and Riser was arrested for suspicion of murder when his car was found to have human blood in it. Even though the police never found the wife's body, Riser went to trial and was convicted of first-degree murder, primarily due to his erratic behavior during the trial. He proclaimed his innocence throughout the trial, but after his conviction, he agreed to show the prosecutors where he hid the body in exchange for having his conviction reduced to second-degree murder. So the moral of the story is that murderers aren't always as clever as they think they are. Uh, by the way, I only know about the Riser case because I happen to be a Linux geek. Well, thanks so much. And I think certainly it would not have been checkmate for the Rangers if the murderer's plan to have the body buried by the road construction crew had gone through. It would have just been a lot harder road. Pardon the pun. Of course, they had other evidence, and the killer still might have been convicted, but there's a big difference between 2006 and when this case was set in terms of the understanding of physical evidence. And at least as portrayed in the episode, it didn't seem likely that he would discredit himself at trial, as he seemed like a very cool customer. Well, now, it is time to thank our Patreon supporter of the day. And I want to go ahead and thank Tammy. Tammy's been one of our Patreon supporters since September, currently supporting us at the Shamus level of $4 or more per month. Thank you so much for your support, Tammy. And that will do it for today. If you are enjoying this podcast, I encourage you to follow us using your favorite podcast software. And if you're listening to the podcast on YouTube, be sure to like the video, subscribe to the channel, and if you have a comment, please feel free to leave it. All those great things help the channel to grow. We'll be back next Saturday with another episode of Tales of the Texas Rangers. And believe it or not, we don't have any podcast episode coming up tomorrow after four weeks weeks of specials, but join us back here on Monday for the adventures of Sam Spade, where... Lenny, I thought you'd never get here. The performance begins at 8.30, and you know how the traffic is, and if we're going to have a bite to eat... You aren't Lenny. Where's Lenny? I don't know, Miss Arlington. I'm supposed to deliver some jewelry. Jewelry? That would be mortuous. 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 Uh, yes, but I... What uh, are you looking at? Your throat. Really? Well, really, Mr... Mr. Mr... Spade, Sam Spade. Well, really, Mr. Spade. 
I'm only waiting for Lenny to get here so we can make the first curtain of Streetcar. And we're going to be late if he doesn't get here. You can understand that, Mr. Spade. You're going to be a little early. Streetcar doesn't open until Monday. And already, and he hasn't shown up. Well, good night, Mr. Spade. Hey! The white ermine cape you were wearing and the black strapless thing needed a touch. But you had it. A diamond necklace. In fact, the tears of night, the same one I had in my pocket, Daphne, was hanging around your lovely neck. I rebuzzed your buzzer and knocked on your door for quite a while until it was quite evident that you were not going to open up. Under the hallway light, I snapped over the necklace case. Mortuous, you had said. And mortuous was what it said stamped inside the case. A gloomy word with a gloomy address. The White Hotel on... I hope you'll be with us then. In the meantime, do send your comments to Box13 at GreatDetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives and check us out on Instagram. Instagram.com slash Great Detectives. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham, signing off.